then let's start working together to get a bill with broad support. I urge my colleagues to support real workforce reforms that we need, that are bipartisan and that address the skills gap issue as well as the other important issues that are included in the Workforce Investment Act, but unfortunately not in the Partisan Skills Act. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California reserves and the gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you again, Madam Chair. I yield three minutes to the uh, gentleman from Indiana, the chairman of the Early Childhood and Elementary and Secondary Education Subcommittee on the committee, uh, Mr. Rakita. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank uh, Chairman Klein and, and Representative Fox for their work and their leadership on this bill. Uh, the Workforce Investment Act is long overdue for reauthorization, especially given the monumental changes to our economy over the past 10 years since the law was last authorized. There are many important reasons to do so, including cutting waste and improving efficiency, but the most important reason to me is the moral one. Quite simply, the existing maze of federal workforce training programs is failing those whom it is intended to be serving. By trying to be all things to all people, the Federal Workforce Training Pro Program is serving no one well, and that's a problem. The federal government's footprint has gotten far too large and our national debt has grown with it. As a result, it is failing to serve the workforce of today and it is piling up ever larger bills for the children of tomorrow, people that don't even exist yet. What the Skills Act does is to consolidate and eliminate many unnecessary and duplicative programs, not simply for the sake of downsizing, but to improve the quality of the workforce training. And that's what we all should be about, Republican, Democrat alike. Business owners understand this. They understand the importance of streamlining and efficiency. They also understand the importance of getting a good return on their investment, and we aren't getting that right now. We have to make sure the federal government abides by those same principles. In addition to consolidating existing programs, which the Skills Act does, it's important for us to make sure that we are actually recovering savings and reducing the deficit as well. We can do both things at once, my friends. I am thankful for the opportunity to work with Ms. Fox and the chairman to include an important provision that would take the next step and reduce the amount of employees at the Department of Labor in line with reducing the programs. <clears throat> the bill gives the director of OMB 60 days to identify how many full-time equivalent employees work or on or administer programs that have been eliminated or consolidated. The director would then have a year to reduce the federal government's workforce by that same number. Jobs that have the most value are jobs that are in the private sector, the productive sector. And to the extent we need jobs in the public sector, they should be to truly support and grow the private sector in a responsible way. Quite simply, if the programs no longer exist, then there is no reason for extra federal government bureaucrats. While many of these federal employees are no doubt very committed to their work, it is immoral for us to borrow more money from our children and grandchildren to pay for unnecessary expenses today. The Department of Labor may exist to serve our workforce, but it is, not, it is not supposed to be a jobs program in and of itself. The legislation before us is a strong step in the right direction and will not only shrink the federal government and reduce our debt, but will ensure that we are delivering better results for America's workforce. By actually reducing the federal government's employment roles, we will be restoring more local control and perhaps more importantly, we'll be making smarter use of Americans' tax dollars. So I encourage my colleagues to support this legislation for that and also the common performance measures that are included in this. One of my constituents, Jim Crampin, a small business owner, serves on the work, one of the workforce investment boards, and he says that these common performance measures are absolutely... Okay. The gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 Thank seconds. Thank you, Chairman. And he says that these uh, common performance measures are absolutely critical. Even the simple difference of, of committing someone to a job for and, and measuring the performance in that <clears throat> and that for that job length from six months to a year makes all the difference in how we really gauge whether or not these programs are successful, whether or not our economy is really growing. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I yield back. The gentleman uh, from Minnesota reserves and the gentleman from California is recognized. Madam Speaker, I yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to uh, the ranking member uh, for his leadership and the committee members as well for working so hard to try to find a balanced uh, approach and a bipartisan approach to a very important bill, which is job training uh, and developing America's workforce. You know, the latest employment report for Nevada came out this morning, 
And while we added 6,600 seasonally adjusted jobs and are on the right path, we cannot shortchange our workers at this critical time. I've heard from my local elected officials who serve on workforce boards, and they don't support the approach of H.R. 803, and that's why I strongly oppose the bill as well. Before coming to Congress, I ran a joint labor management training academy in Las Vegas that helped train thousands of Nevadans, youth, adults, and dislocated workers to find careers in the hospitality industry each and every year. So I know the value of quality training for prospective workers. I'm opposing the so-called Skills Act because it's a partisan bill that's dressed up as a Workforce Investment Act legislation. It would block grant 35 work programs, pitting youth, older workers, and workers with disabilities against each other for funding. And it would freeze job training investment for seven years, even though funding for workforce programs have already been cut in half since 2001. This at a time when there is a growing demand for training and placement of workers. You know, the democratic alternative to this bill builds partnerships with the private sector, with labor, with community colleges. It evaluates the efficiency of workforce programs and it expands the use of on-the-job training and incumbent worker training. Now, I will work with anyone from any party. Gentlemen, additional one minute. The gentleman is recognized for an additional minute. Thank you. I will work with anyone from any party who has a good idea for how we can get the American people back to work. Unfortunately, H.R. 803 is not that bill. The gentleman uh, yields back. The gentleman from... Uh, uh, California Reserves and the gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you again, Madam <laughs> Chair. At this time, I'm very pleased and honored to uh, yield one minute to the distinguished House Majority Leader, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Cantor. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Minnesota, the chairman of the Education and Workforce Committee, for bringing this bill forward and his leadership on so many issues affecting working families across this country. Madam Chair, I rise this morning to speak in favor of the Skills Act. Today, there are 20 million Americans unemployed or underemployed. And I want to take a moment and speak about the individual that's looking for their next job and explain how the Skills Act will actually help them. First of all, the Skills Act streamlines the complicated maze of existing federal programs. Rather than spending time figuring out which one of 30 different programs you're supposed to go to, this bill creates a one-stop shop and creates a one-stop workforce investment fund. Second, if you need job training, the Skills Act eliminates bureaucratic hurdles, such as first requiring you to work on your resume and develop an individual employment plan so that you can access the training that you need right away. Third, by emphasizing the role of local employers on your local workforce training board, the Skills Act helps ensure that tr the training you receive is related to the jobs actually available in your area. And finally, the Skills Act makes sure that you receive quality training by making it easier for community colleges and technical schools to actually participate in these workforce training programs. What does all this mean? Better, more accessible job training to help more people who are unemployed find jobs faster. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to tour an automotive workshop at the Northern Virginia Community College and saw firsthand the need to train skilled workers. I want to thank Chairman Klein, who went to, with me to that community college, Congresswoman Virginia Fox, and Congresswoman Susan Brooks for their leadership on this important issue. The Skills Act has been endorsed by numerous employers, community colleges, and systems community college systems, and a number of governors, because they all recognize that a broken workforce training system hurts those in need of assistance. We have a chance to fix 
that broken system with this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support the Skills Act, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Minnesota reserves, and the gentleman from California is recognized. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding time and thank him for his leadership on the committee and what he has done for education in this country. Madam Speaker, never have job training and educational opportunities been so crucial for so many people as they are during this challenging economic time. Our country's economic situation is getting better. Uh, last month, we added 236,000 jobs, and the unemployment rate fell to 7.7 percent, the lowest rate in four years. But the unemployment rate in my home state of North Carolina is 9.4 percent, and in my uh, first district, one in four people are below the poverty level. The S uh, Skills Act, uh, Madam Speaker, will stall our delicate economic recovery at a time when we must invest in our workforce to ensure hardworking people are able to access the training they need to achieve the American dream. The Skills Act kills workforce development as we know it. It would turn 35 important workforce development programs into a block grant system and force effective programs targeted to help disadvantaged populations to compete against each other for funding. The bill would subject workforce development programs to partisan politics by putting funding in the hands of governors and would remove seats reserved for community interest groups and community colleges on local workforce investment boards and instead leave the decision of where to invest the money in the hands of who? Big business. H.R. 803 would devastate the innovative partnerships the Workforce Investment Act has created in my district. The bill would jeopardize the partnership between Lenore Community College and Spirit Aerosystems in Kinston, where students gain technical experience for careers in aerospace. It would endanger Youth Bill, which helps disadvantaged youth find employment in Goldsboro and Wilson and Elizabeth City, and a workforce development and training center run by Edgecombe Community College, which helps retrain dislocated workers in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. For these reasons, Madam Speaker and more, I urge my colleagues to oppose H.R. 803 and support the Democratic alternative. California Reserves and the gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Madam Chair, can I inquire as to the time remaining on each side? The gentleman from Minnesota has nine and a half minutes remaining. And the gentleman from California has eight and three quarters minute remaining. Thank you. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Kentucky, a member of the committee, Mr. Guthrie. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. And I rise today in support of the Skills Act. This legislation is a key tool to improve employee skills and in turn strengthen our nation's workforce. Jobs and growing our nation's economy must be our top priority. There has never been a more critical time to make sure that our workforce has the opportunity to find new jobs or receive additional education. The bill includes a number of positive changes to the workforce system creating a flexible workforce investment fund to give local workforce investment boards additional flexibility is an important step to get more workers through the system. This bill also does away with an antiquated sequence of services which delays access to training. In addition, the bill enhances adult literacy, a cause that is particularly important to me. Today, approximately 12 million Americans are without work, yet jobs are open in many industries, especially in manufacturing. When I travel around my district, I continue to hear that employers are actively looking for workers, but have difficulty finding the skilled workforce they need. Technology will always be advancing. We must ensure our workforce is armed with the skill set to perform the tasks that are required today and tomorrow. This bill will address this problem head on and allow for the education these individuals need. These high skilled, high wage and high demand jobs are the pathways to the American dream. I've seen firsthand at my family's manufacturing facility how lives can be transformed through additional skills and investing in our workforce. There are countless benefits to a better, educati better, edu better educating our workforce as our economy continues to rebuild from the recession. We must do everything we can to put Americans back to work. I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this effort and our nation's workforce. I yield back.
the balance of my time. Back the gentleman from Minnesota reserves and the gentleman from California is recognized. I yield uh, uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from California for yielding. Uh, I rise today in strong opposition to the so-called Skills Act, H.R. 803, a bill that would fail to live up to our responsibility to job seekers, businesses, and working men and women across our country. I served as mayor of the city of Providence for eight years and saw closely what excellent workforce boards do in my home state. Right now, we should be doing everything we can to put our nation back to work and offer assistance for folks who are struggling to find employment. But unfortunately, this highly partisan bill does just the opposite. It would block grant and effectively eliminate 35 programs, including programs that help dislocated workers, veterans, disabled workers, and other disadvantaged populations, putting these individuals at high risk of losing access to services. And even though funding for the Workforce Investment Act has been cut in half since 2001, this radical proposal would freeze investments in job training and other workforce investment services for seven years. Mr. Inhoas, Mr. Inhoas, Mr. Miller, and Mr. Tierney have offered a compromise alternative, a common sense alternative that would create strategic partnerships with employers, community colleges, labor unions, and nonprofits to find new jobs and careers for working families. The democratic alternative would expand the central role of community colleges in job training by authorizing $8 billion for President Obama's Community College to Career Fund to help community colleges recognize credentials so that students would, will graduate with job training that meets the needs of employers. It would also better serve high poverty areas with effective services by creating innovation funds to expand the use of promising strategies for adults and young people. Ladies and gentlemen, our country is facing serious economic challenges, and we need a serious solution like that offered in the workforce.